Hello, my name is Dr. Emily Knox. I'm a researcher currently based at the Andalusian School of Public Health in Granada, Spain. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk, which, as you can see from the slide, is about the response of sport to the current coronavirus pandemic. I'm going to talk about some of the issues to receive most media coverage in relation to the health crisis and sport's role in that. Uh, I'll attempt to put sport's actual response into context. Uh, finally, and explain why this is important and the implications this may have for future sport, physical activity, and health. What is the coronavirus? Uh, the coronavirus is a type of virus. The current pandemic relates to an infectious disease which results from a recently discovered strain of the virus. It was first identified and reported to the World Health Organization on December the 31st, 2019 in Hubei province in China who reported a number of cases of pneumonia of unknown origin. A new type of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, was ultimately isolated from infected patients, characterizing a new pathology, which was later called COVID-19. At the time of making this talk on the 6th of May, 2020, cases have hit 3.66 million worldwide, claiming the lives of 257,000 people. At the time of you listening to this talk, those figures are likely much higher. Given that we cannot run away from the coronavirus, you may ask why is the response of sporting bodies to the COVID-19 pandemic important? Well, firstly, the sports sector is currently a priority area for increasing population rates of physical activity for public health in many countries. Both the World Health Organization and the European Commission have issued guidance and policy encouraging populations at a global and European level to engage in physical activity for the good of their health. Sport is an important vehicle through which physical activity can be promoted. It reaches huge audiences, provides role models, and enthuses spectators to get involved. The response of the sporting world to COVID-19 is hugely important because the image projected by sporting bodies will impact upon the population's view of sport not only of hardcore fans, but of the wider population too. And its contribution to society, with potential further implications on the involvement of the population in sport and physical activity. Further, Brendan Perrin outlined in 2018 in the Journal of the Legal Aspects of Sport, the parameters of social responsibility of sport, stating that while most industries are being held increasingly responsible for engaging in socially responsible business practices, and contributing to public interest efforts, professional sports are likely held to an even higher standard of what is traditionally considered corporate social responsibility. Professional sports are intricately embedded into their communities, arguably more dependent on consumer and government support, with greater influence on culture and more power to improve community well-being. These facts lead to the expectation that professional sports will contribute more to society than just exciting exhibitions. Thus, sporting bodies have a responsibility not only to transmit to the grandeur of competition and achieving sporting success, they also have a responsibility to promote positive health and values within society. The 10 big values of honesty, integrity, humility, Professionalism, discipline, toughness, work ethic, enjoyment, passion, and respect should be inherent not only to sporting activity, but also to the way it is managed, underpinning the very core of the image of sport. The role of sport in community does not, therefore, end or get put on hold when sporting events stop, as has been seen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, it still has a huge role to play in terms of its responsibility towards the community and promoting positive health within the population. Perceptions of the general population in relation to sports response to the pandemic are therefore of vital importance. Messages propagated in the media can have a resounding impact on views held by the general population in relation to sport. There is a whole body of evidence and psychological theory to support this which we will not go into today as it is not within the scope of this talk, but cleverly constructed messages can be used to give different perceptions of the same essential facts. This example shows quite powerfully the way in which emotive language can be used to instill certain feelings within the recipient of a message. Some of the text is missing, so I'll read them out. 
The first on the, first on the left says, Young Manchester City footballer on £25,000 a week splashes out on Mansion on the market for £2.25 million despite having never started a Premier League match. Whilst the one on the right reads, Manchester City starlet Phil Foden buys new £2 million home for his mum. Aside from the debate about whether man buys house is really noteworthy, these two pieces of writing do provoke a worthwhile debate about the way in which language is used to influence readers' perceptions. Both are headlines from the same newspaper, written in the same year about two different football players. The facts of each story are very similar in nature. Both players were of similar age when the story was written. At similar stages of their careers, both contracted to Manchester City Football Club, neither having started a Premier League game, both having represented England youth teams. Both stories report on the players having bought houses of a similar price Yet the choice of language is very different, serving to frame one story negatively and the other positively. For instance, the negatively framed headline uses the word mansion to create images of excess and distance from family values. It, refer it refers to the player's salary, playing on common negative beliefs that footballers are overpaid. The phrase splashes out again suggests that this was an excessive act of extravagance. Finally, the final clause, despite having never started a Premier League game, is a blatant overture that this individual does not deserve what they have. On the other hand, the positively framed story instead uses the word home, creating feelings of warmth and strong family values. It refers to the player by name, creating a personal connection and increasing feelings of relatedness, and refers to them as a starlet, suggesting that this person does deserve what they have, due to their exceptional talent. This story opts to use the neutral word buy instead of splashes out despite the quantities of money involved being quite similar. It mentioned that the house was purchased for the individual's mother, again reinforcing their family values, whilst omitting any reference to their salary or the fact that this individual has also not started a Premier League game. So we see how stories can be presented in such a way within the media that it influences our perceptions of those taking part in sport. But with the current pandemic influencing every aspect of society and the expectation society has of sport due to its aforementioned role in public health and social responsibility, sport itself has come under the spotlight with potential repercussions on public perceptions of sport as a whole. So how has the media presented sport during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I decided to have a look and I conducted a rapid review of news media items in both the UK and Spain in relation to football. I chose football because it is arguably the sport with most visibility throughout Europe, putting it in a prime position to promote physical activity and health, and it is strongly associated by, by the public with ideas of social responsibility. The rapid review covered news pieces published online by the BBC, Sky Sports and The, and the Guardian, in the UK, and Marca and El País in Spain, and included items published from the 13th of March 2020, at which time football leagues had been suspended in both countries. Neutral items, for, for instance, those relating to player-manager profiles, transfer speculation, recapping historic games, speculating on, on future fixture implications, and so on, were ignored. Items were selected which inferred moral or social responsibility of the clubs in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. A total of 73 relevant items were identified, with 83% of these presenting a negative image of football's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Within these items, two major themes emerged, highlighting two sources of major criticism for football's response. The first of these was the furloughing of non-playing staff by football clubs and the use of government schemes designed to support small businesses to cover staff wages. In general, articles pointed to the large profits of clubs, especially clubs such as Liverpool and Tottenham, um, clubs which um, have, have reported reasonably high um, profit margins in recent years, as evidence that clubs were not the intended recipients of the scheme and argued that football clubs were taking advantage of this scheme. They highlighted the fact that government furloughing schemes 
were ult are ultimately paid for by taxpayers, meaning that clubs using the scheme would therefore be essentially asking their supporters and the community they are supposed to serve, many of whom may well be experiencing hard times themselves as a result, given soaring unemployment during the pandemic, to pay their bills, whilst all the while directors and shareholders continue to make profits. Further, articles often emphasize the fact that non-playing staff who often demonstrate much greater loyalty to their club than playing staff in terms of years of service would be expected to take a pay cut of between 20 and 30%. This creates an anti-Robin Hood type image, the rich stealing from the poor at times of great need. A recurring issue at the heart of many items was the morality of football, with phrases such as the bankrupt morality of football being particularly hard-hitting and resounding at a time of severe financial hardship for many of these items readers. The second theme related to arguments in relation to player salaries. In relation to this theme, language emerged that is more appropriate to reports of war or conflict. Words such as battle, row, wage war, divide, standoff were used with one article outright stating that football was heading towards civil war. Reasons given by players for rejecting pay cuts, which we will return to, were largely ignored. Even in the few articles which referred to football as reasons for refusing pay cuts, a dangerous and damaging fight was depicted between players and society, players and their clubs, players' unions and clubs, and clubs and society. Players were largely painted as comic book villains clutching onto their bounty, whilst the city around them burned. Specific players were often singled out for criticism to add to this idea of one bad egg ruining the rest of the batch. Reference was again made to the morality of football, with, with one writer suggesting that football existed in a moral vacuum. But is it fair that sport, in this case football, is judged in this way? We all have opinions about whether footballers are paid too much or whether owners would pass our own fit and proper persons test. But given that sporting events are cancelled and so it cannot mount a defence based on the entertainment it provides, the talent it displays, or the lives it changes getting people active or giving them a dream to reach, it cannot produce its own positive media response. The sources of these news items, which take on the role of judge, the BBC for instance, has a weekly global readership of 376 million. Sky Sports has 2.19 million subscribers, with around 38 million visits a day to its site. The Guardian has 20.9 million online readers a month. Marker is read by 2.5 million people a day. And El País counts with around 20 million online readers a month. Their reports, therefore, have exceptional reach and the potential to have a large influence on the perceptions of the population. Language was used in their reports to instill negative perceptions in readers who will likely have scant understanding of the issues at hand. Yet their reports in relation to football and their response to the coronavirus largely focus on two main issues which are complicated and multifaceted, presenting them with legal context and rarely any counter-arguments. Indeed, many businesses, big and small, are wrestling with tough economic decisions as the economic system for which they were designed shuts its door on them. This calls for a much bigger debate about the morality and adequacy of, social, of societal structure, which far outstretches the morality of football. Further, the majority of clubs in the Premier League who furloughed staff ended up reversing this decision largely due to pressure from supporters groups, the criticism of, in, the criticism of influential figures such as, ex -play, such as ex players and so on, and appeals from their local communities. This shows that despite years of failing regulations within the game designed to govern its financial accountability and ensure fairness, there is still a large degree of accountability within football, mere days or weeks after coming to a decision which likely was not easy to come by the first time around, requiring numerous meetings with board members, directors, shareholders and team mascots, football clubs across the UK admitted they were wrong and reversed the decision. Further, the Players' Football Association has argued that accepting a wage cut would result in a loss of £200 million of tax contributions to the government, with players instead preferring to continue paying these taxes and making individual contributions to help health services and charities during the pandemic. The tax deficit appears to be a highly valid argument, and yet it has been given little visibility in the press, 
with the UK Health Minister Matt Hancock even choosing to publicly, publicly call out footballers, ignoring these figures and the evidence that should players actually agree to such cuts, it could indeed further damage the struggling economy. Context, complexity, valid financial, financial arguments, and as we will later discuss, sporting bodies' actual moves to enforce social distancing are all left observing, observing from the gallery with no input into the debate. Footballers and football clubs may make convenient uh, scapegoats during this time of crisis, but the damage done to the image of football and sport could have further negative Im implications on future public health, which may take a long time to heal. This isn't to say that sport should not be judged for its response to the crisis. Given the privileged position occupied by sport in modern society and the influence it has as a result, it is fair that we don't let it off the hook in times of crisis and continue to expect it to be an example for health and its values of respect, humility, teamwork, and so on. But a more objective consideration should be considered. One aspect that could be considered is whether sports bodies took timely action to impose social distancing measures. In the absence of a vaccine, the only effective measure to reducing the spread of COVID-19 and negative impact of the, of, of the pandemic is social distancing. Research from April of this year, published in bulletins of the World Health Organization, demonstrates that early moves to confine the public before the number of COVID-19 cases reached a certain peak may be more important than the duration of confinement for reducing COVID-19 infections. Thus, proactive enforcement of social distancing, i.e. when very few cases have yet to be confirmed, of a shorter duration is related with a lower risk of infection than reactive, than reactive confinement, i.e. in response to a high level of cases for a longer period of time. So one marker we can take of sports response to the crisis in line with its values of, of supporting societal health would be to examine its decision making in relation to the suspension of sporting activity. A commentary published in Managing Sport and Leisure in March 2020 by Purnell and colleagues argues the specific case of football, suggesting that football in the UK has actually demonstrated leadership and forward thinking in response to the crisis, moving to protect the health of its employees and spectators by imposing social distancing through the suspension of events and training, despite the obvious negative implications of this to the future prosperity of these sports, taking these actions earlier than government moves to do the same thing. With the emergence and spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, a number of flagship international sporting events have had to be suspended or cancelled. The ATP tennis tour was suspended on March the 12th. UEFA suspended all of its European football tournaments, including the Champions League, on March the 12th as well. The International Olympic Committee waited longer to act, finally moving to suspend the Japan 2020 Olympics on the 24th of March, with the new games now being moved from July 2020 to July 2021. As this graphic shows, large parts of the world were operating full or partial uh, border closures by the 31st of March, with many border closures having already been in effect for a number of weeks. Thus, with international events, the prospect of empty stadiums and disrupted travel for participants due to the grounding of flights closure of borders, and forced confinement following arrival in new countries may have forced the hand of many governing bodies. However, we can examine the national responses of sporting bodies where travel res restrictions will not have had such an effect when considering the adequacy of the sporting response. Let's look at evidence from the UK. On the 13th of March 2020, the English Premier League, the Football Association, English Football League, Barclays FA Women's Super League and FA Women's Championship collectively agreed to postpone the professional game in England until Friday the 3rd of April at the earliest. This postponement has since been extended until the 30th of April 2020 and indeed um, beyond. On Monday the 16th of March 2020, the English football authorities also postponed all community recreational grassroots and community football. On the same day, the Rugby Football League shut down its season, stating that player welfare and maintaining the integrity of the competition are key concerns moving forward. Equally, our responsibilities to football league communities remain front of mind for all of us. On the 18th of March, the English Cricket Board took the decision to suspend all 
grassroots cricket, with the upcoming season also likely to be suspended. In contrast, the UK government never took firm action in response to the COVID-19 spread until March the 23rd, 10 days after the football community collectively took action. In fact, on the 19th of March, Prime Minister Boris Johnson addressed the nation, stating that we can still turn the tide on progression of the virus by simply following government advice to social distance. Similarly, in Spain, La Liga Santander postponed competitive football on the 12th of March, two days before the government officially suspended outdoor social activities on the evening of the 14th. The Handball League was also suspended on the 12th of March, whilst the Royal Federation of Spanish Hockey suspended all competitions on March the 11th. France announced confinement measures on March the 17th, but the French Professional Football League's Administrative Council decided unanimously to suspend the League One Conferama and Domino's League Two Championship immediately and until further notice on March the 13th, four days before. In Italy, lockdown was announced on March the 9th, with the government taking steps to suspend the Football League and all of the sporting events on the same day. In the USA, the NBA took the decision to suspend the league on March the 12th after one player tested positive, with the NHL having already suspended the day before. The NFL season has yet to start, but the preseason has also been suspended, and serious talks to suspend the start of the season, something that has only ever occurred twice in its history, are underway. The US Soccer League also suspended all activity on the 12th of March, stating that the health and safety of players coaches, staff, and fans is our main priority. All baseball, softball, lacrosse, and football leagues also announced cancellations or suspensions. In comparison, the political response was uncoordinated and piecemeal, with only a handful of governors recommending social distancing measures by this date, and the majority of firmer measures not being introduced until around March the 16th in the more heavily affected states. At the same time, the president seems more concerned about upcoming elections, playing on whatever team that gets him the most supporters and meaning that his lockdown stance sees him encouraging anti-lockdown protests while at the same time urging state police to knock the crap out of protesters. Admittedly, from a, politi from a political aspect, it could be argued that our analysis so far has gone for low-hanging fruit. But what about nations whose governments have received plaudits for their apparently rapid response? To the health crisis. Germany has opted for a different response to its European counterpart, instead introducing strict social distancing measures on the 22nd of March. Though a number of states have introduced stricter measures, with Bavaria and Thailand being the first, having had their residents in lockdown since March the 21st. However, the Football Bundesliga had already moved to suspend the football season on March the 13th. Germany's second and third top sports also appear to have moved quickly, with Bundesliga handball suspending all fix fixtures on March the 12th, stating that the entire handball professional sport has decided to take this very difficult step, since the top priority is, of course, the health and protection of the population. Further, the German Hockey League was suspended on March the 10th. It should be kept in mind that the case of Germany is difficult to judge, given that decisions over suspending sporting events were largely influenced by the movement of a number of German states to ban gatherings of more than 1,000 than people. In New Zealand, the government declared a state of emergency and announced confinement measures on the 24th of March. The super rugby season in New Zealand was suspended indefinitely on March the 15th, though it is true that this was largely provoked by government measures enforcing a two-week confinement for all overseas arrivals, making continuation of the competition untenable. However, rugby within the country ceased on the 23rd of March, one day before national measures, whilst all netball leagues had either been suspended or cancelled by March the 20th. Thus, it can be seen that even in countries deemed to have acted relatively swiftly to confine segments of the population, in response to the spread of the virus. Sport provided a strong example, at times leading the way and at others acting in consort with their government. Why is this important? Why is it important that we judge sports response to an unrelated health emergency? When the pandemic finally passes 
and society begins to move forward with an adapted reality, sport and physical activity will need to pick itself up from the ashes too. We already know that pre-pandemic levels of physical activity are low. These graphs show data collected by the World Health Organization in 2018 in various European countries and shows the percentage of children, adults and older adults meeting physical activity guidelines within that country. We can see that many people are, are failing to get enough physical activity. For example, 76% of Spanish children, more than 78% of English and Northern Irish children, the majority of French and German children at all age groups fail to get enough physical activity. Data in the US aren't any better, with the Center for Disease Control suggesting that around 77% of adults fail to meet guidelines, with children also showing low levels with just 35% of boys and 17% of girls meeting guidelines. Potentially, even more concerning, is that data collected prior to the current health crisis suggests that trends were getting worse, not better, with physical activity levels in many countries decreasing from year to year. It is imp also important to note that these graphs likely overestimate physical activity engagement, given that they only consider moderate to vigorous um, guidelines and do not include strengthening or intensity exercise guidelines as well. How might the current pandemic influence physical activity levels of the nation? There are a number of reasons to think that physical activity levels will likely decrease as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. While containing the virus as quickly as possible is the urgent public health priority, there have been few public health guidelines for the public as to what people can or should do in terms of maintaining their daily exercise or physical activity routines. This is disappointing given that physical activity is a policy priority area for both the European Commission, covering all European countries, and the World Health Organization. Those in countries with quarantine measures are prohibited from any outdoor, outdoor activities, whilst team sports are also banned for the, for the foreseeable future. Exercise is limited to that which can be carried out within the confines of one's home. Further, any exercise must be completed without the usual support many rely on to regularly engage in physical activity, be that motivation and support from an exercise buddy or support group, facilities available at gyms or sports clubs, fresh air and the feel-good factor of being in the great outdoors, and with summer fast approaching, the desire of building people to get active by the, event, by the various events that are typically held throughout the summer season. Chenetel argued in their paper published in February this year in the Journal of Sports and Health Sciences that lockdown may have unintended negative consequences since such efforts to avoid human-to-human -human transmission of the virus may lead to reduced physical activity. It is likely that prolonged homestay may lead to, increase, to increased sedentary behaviours such as spending excessive amounts of time sitting, reclining, or lying down for screen-based activities, such as playing games, watching the television, using mobile devices, and so on. Reducing regular physical activity or engaging in avoidance activities that consequently, that consequently lead to an increased risk for and potential worsening of chronic health conditions. Exercise at home using various safe, simple, and easily implementable exercise is well suited to avoiding the airborne coronavirus and maintaining fitness level. A further, public, a, a further paper published in March this year by Lucy and Grazia also outlined the benefits of physical activity for overcoming the present crisis. There is, of course, the potential that as measures are reduced or removed, physical, physical activity levels could actually increase as people go sprinting outside to get their daily permitted dose of exercise. The picture on the bottom right hand side was Madrid on the 2nd of May, the first day following relaxation of measures in Spain, which allowed individuals to leave their residence only for sport or exercise. However, we have no idea whether this activity truly conforms increases in physical activity or whether it will even be maintained over a longer term. I suspect not. We are now all used to hearing that following the pandemic, we will all have to get used to a new reality. We don't know exactly what, what that will look like just yet, but it is certain that some social distancing measures will remain in place. This may still restrict access to sport, for instance, through the closure of grassroots sports clubs and leisure centres. Further, the loss of income during quarantine will reduce disposable income available to many 
to access sport and physical, and physical activity opportunities. Whilst many grassroots sports clubs may never reopen due to financial collapse. Finally, whilst evidence has yet to be produced about the effect of COVID-19 on physical activity levels, we do have evidence from other SARS viruses, SARS being severe acute respiratory syndrome, of which is a type of coronavirus. A number of studies conducted with survivors of other SARS viruses show significantly reduced physical activity capacity following disease recovery. There are currently more than 1.2 million diagnosed survivors of COVID-19. Not all of those can expect to suffer chronic physiological side effects, but some will, and the pool is huge. Thus, a lot of individuals may have resultant impaired physical capacity. The majority of these individuals will also be in the age group of the over 70s, adding to the challenges already posed by inactivity amongst this subpopulation. This does, of course, also increase the pull of physical activity as a potential health strategy, but the motivational effects of decreased physical capacity on desire to be active must be, <clears throat> sorry, must be considered. So what's the take-home message? Well, we mustn't let sport be confined to the image that the media wishes to create for it. The stakes for the health of the population are simply too high. Media messages must be reframed to more fairly and positively reflect sport's role during the COVID-19 pandemic. Currently, journalists, social commentators, and even politicians are framing sport as being greedy and morally bankrupt, full of squabbling and infighting, as participants strive to protect their own personal interests. Money is clearly a huge issue in relation to sport, and arguments will continue in this vein. But the media will have us believe that money is more important than sport than the well-being of participants and supporters. Yet we have seen that valid reasons may lie behind any apparent reluctance of players to relinquish their earnings, whilst messages coming from football, rugby, hockey, netball, softball clubs and so on alike have all been clear and consistent that player welfare, fan welfare and the integrity of the sport itself is the main priority. The health and safety of players, coaches, Staff and fans is our main priority. The top priority is, of course, the health and protection of the population. Player welfare and maintaining the integrity of the competition are key concerns moving forward. These are just some examples of the content of official statements issued by various clubs. But it is more than just words. We have seen consistently across the globe that sporting bodies have acted proactively in introducing protective measures the firmest and most effective available, total shutdown, to protect their fans and staff despite the economic loss that this would mean for them, precipitating government action to protect citizens. Why is that not front page news? And you may think, well, they would have been forced to shut down eventually anyway. But with Premier League football clubs losing on average around a million pounds every day that competition is suspended, it cannot be denied that they acted, pro that they acted proactively at their own expense. The final point is that sport is out of touch with, with society, so far out of touch that it cannot possibly live up to its values of honesty, integrity, humility, and so on. Again, to some extent, the media may have a point. Owners of big clubs have long been criticised for their extravagant lifestyle. Chelsea Football Club is the weekend placing of Roman, Abra of, of Roman Abramovich when he can get away from his yacht, whilst the Glazer family owned absolutely everything aside from a football club so decided to add Manchester United to their shelf. The examples are endless, but can we really say that football clubs are out of touch? In fact, COVID-19 has made them accountable. We have seen a number of examples of clubs changing, de changing decisions due to pressure from fans and the local community. This demonstrates a level of accountability totally absent in other multi-million pound industries. Who held British Airways accountable, for example, when they furloughed more than 30,000 workers in the UK in early April, despite reporting profits of more than 2.3 billion the year before, or reverse McDonald's decision to furlough 165,000 UK staff, despite UK profits of more than 406 million pounds last year. Indeed, sport appears unique in its accountability to the community it serves. So in conclusion, evidence suggests that sport has acted reasonably to the current health crisis. Uh, crisis making the health of participants and supporters its main, its main priority. Despite this, discourse around sport in popular media is largely negative, 
and could be damaging to sports reputation. Messages must therefore be positively reframed to present the positive aspects of sport and its role during the current health crisis. Governing bodies should also move as soon as possible to provide new physical activity guidelines to the population, given the importance of maintaining or even increasing physical activity levels both during and after the, and after the, the pandemic on health outcomes. If this is not done, the potential negative consequences are great. Disillusioned people may become demotivated to participate in sport. There could be a reduction in population engagement with physical activity, which would be hugely damaging to population health, especially given that engagement is already low and damage to the prestige of international events, such as the Olympics or the FIFA World Cup, could have broader economic or political implications in addition to those related with health. We've now reached the end of this talk on the response of sport to the COVID-19 pandemic and potential implications. I hope that wherever you are watching this, yourself and your family are safe and well, and you are able to keep practicing and enjoying some form of sport. I included a lot of news snippets and information stolen from the internet throughout this presentation. The next couple of slides include the URLs to all of the images, news stories, and etc. That, that, that were included. Please note that these do not relate to the material used in the review. They were selected based on the fact that they illustrated more clearly a specific point, and so many of the included materials do not come from the five sources included in the review. Thanks for listening.